Excellent. Um, and we're just one minute away from going live. So just to let you know, when I play your video, Jamel, there is like a three second, four second delay just because I've got a few buttons to press. So don't worry if it doesn't start immediately. It's not a problem. It's just me doing some stuff. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go three, two, one, live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Les Matter Live Lounge. It's been a fantastic week, and I'm delighted to be here on the last day of the Les Matter campaign. My name is Jamal Geraghty. I'm a lecturer within the adult nursing department at King's College University in London, and I'm also a nurse consultant for tissue viability. It's a very great pleasure for me today to present to you the story of David, who has lived experience of homelessness and also leg ulceration. Any of us can experience homelessness at any point in our lives. To fully appreciate homelessness, we must have an insight into health inequalities. There's lots of literature out there about health inequalities, but I would urge you, if you haven't seen the Marmoth Review by Sir Professor Michael Marmoth, to do look at that. Not having a roof over your head, somewhere to call home, a safe place can have huge social, psychological, and physical implications on a person. People who are experiencing homelessness can develop a wound for a number of reasons. There's a proportion of the homeless community who develop a wound in the lower limb from injecting in the femoral vein. They can develop venous ulcers, abscesses, venous skin changes, and skin and soft tissue infections. This can happen even years after stopping injecting, or it can even happen after once or twice injecting. I remember meeting a lady who had injected 20 years ago and she'd only now developed a wound. There is also a proportion of the homeless community who develop venous-related ulcers and skin changes from never injecting in the legs. This is because they often spend hours and hours on their legs every day, walking sometimes five to six hours. Sometimes if they've nowhere to go at night, they can spend time in bus shelters or even on the night bus or on the tube, sitting with their legs down. I remember seeing a gentleman who had his shoes on for two weeks and was, was unable to remove it. This is a real problem in this population. Specialist wound care is not commissioned in its own right as a physical health need for this population. And this is something that I feel strongly needs to change. I have seen firsthand the wonderful work that can change when you have specialist services providing this care. I personally have led a wound clinic for people experiencing homelessness in Camden in London. I've seen firsthand the speed of diagnosis that can happen on the day, instigating treatment of compression therapy, healing and prevention. But not just that, there's been a huge positive experience and also almost 100% of engagement with the people that were coming to the clinic, not to mention the importance, improved well-being, improved sleep, reduce pain. I'm really delighted and honoured to have with me today and for all of us, Right Honourable Anne Clute. Anne has spent her whole life campaigning for patients and the NHS and was the, and the MP for the constituency of within Wales. Anne, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. Would you like to say a few words about this topic? I know it's very close to your heart. Thank you, Jamal. Yes, I'm very pleased to join you and thank you for the invitation. I'm always pleased to talk about this because I suffered a lot of pain through my leg ulcer and um, I'm particularly um, bothered about people who are homeless, who are forced to live out on the street because I know how painful it was when I had a roof over my head. So what it's like if you live uh, rough, uh, I'd hate to think, but I'm glad people like you are helping uh, 
people suffering from leg ulcers and who are homeless. It took me quite a long time to have a diagnosis. And that's what I'd like to stress is the importance of getting a diagnosis quickly. Because otherwise you spend a lot of time having dressings, going backwards and forwards to clinics and the root cause is not treated. When I first saw somebody, a consultant, I have to say, um, because my GP sent me to see one, he told me that he wasn't quite sure what it was, but uh, that I should try Vaseline. Well, I'm afraid Vaseline certainly wasn't the answer. And the other thing I would like to just warn against is the use of Manuka honey, because some people are allergic to Manuka honey. And I see it's been pushed quite a lot recently, but I had that on my leg and I had excruciating pain. Some people are allergic, I was one of them. So that's just a little warning. But I'd like to thank all the people who helped me. And that's why I'm so anxious uh, to see others helped in the same way. Thank you, Anne, for sharing that wonderful experience and, and your words of wisdom, as always. We appreciate you joining us for the call. And please do stay on the line and watch the wonderful video that we're about to show, the conversation between myself and David that took place about two weeks ago. Thank you, David. I know you're not here with us at the minute for your bravery and strength in sharing your story. David, thanks so much for taking the time to share your story with myself and everyone out there. Um, I just want to ask you if you could share with us your journey of living with your leg ulcer and what life has been like today, up to date, living with your wound. So the journey is not easy because I got done nearly two years, leg ulcer. Mm -hmm. I got problems with inject, I'm inject, I'm using drugs, just this legs is very hard to live because I have to like have it, have it big also because I have it abs abscess, I miss. Yeah. So I have it operation, they drain it. And after you have to go for the dress, most important when it's drain it, after you have to go for the, change the dressing like three times in a week. That's the most important to, to follow because if you not follow, you get infection and it's very hard to healing. Just if you are, I've been before from the start, I've been in the street. So it's been very hard very hard to follow the appointments because before you, they give you an appointment, like you have to go to nine o'clock to book and after you have to go for the appointment. And if you're in the street, it's, you don't know where you are. One day you're there, one day you're a different place. So it's not been easy, so. So you've lived with this for two years? Nearly, it's more like two years, yeah. Do you remember when you got it, how it happened? Uh, the, uh, I miss, I inject there, I miss, and uh, they've been big upset, so they have to drain it. And they make me big hole, so they have to have to go for the change the dressing like three times in a week. What did you? What was your understanding of it when you got it? What did you think this was? Did you know what it was? I just been thinking, is it just upsets like yeah, some and it be go down? It's nothing like so serious, yeah. Just after us, like when it's when they have the operation, they yeah, they're starting to be serious because it's not been like healing. It's been without the compressor. Like, you have to be special nurse, have to look after that. You have to go change it. If you not go, you never heal. And it's, I've, been, I've been in prison, like six months. They look after that as well. Like, three times, just, it's st still, when I come from the prison, it's still problems, still, it's, it's still not healed, like how it's supposed to be healed. And so I, when you were in prison, you had the ulcer as well. Yes. And how was, how was life while you were in prison, living with the wound? How did you manage? This is not easy because you are with somebody else. And if you, the, the, the wounds, the, the ulcer, like smell, the infection smell. So if you don't look after the proper, if you don't change the dressing, and sometimes it's not your food, sometimes the nurse, like, not come come in next day or something, so you smell. And then your, your roommate, roommate, like, is not happy because it's not nice to them, you know, because you can smell it. So if anywhere you go, you can ta can't take the bus. You can't take nothing because it's smell and the people even don't want to sit next to you, you know. It's so really hard. It's, really it's diff very difficult, you know. Just I say, I, I, I've been starting, I, I wanted to heal it because you, you, you can't do nothing. You can't do, you know, you know, if my family, I don't want to go to my family because if I don't want to see me like that. 
Because I'm, I'm, I don't want to, I'm embarrassed to see me like that. So life at the minute, you, you just tell us, for example, when you get up in the morning, what is it like with the wound on a day-to-day -day basis when, from when you get up in the morning? Well, for example, day? like yes, day before I fall asleep, I sleep like all day. When I wake up and I miss my appointment for the nurse, so when I miss the appointment, I don't have chance because I can't go just to end, like the emergency because they, they don't have the special like uh, dressing. So if you're going to hospital for the uh, for the emergency, they're not help you. That that just maybe hold you for for one day or something. Just just not that make it worse for you. With you putting the dressing, you're not supposed to be there and make it worse that, to like. So and uh, just this morning I wake up and it's all like it's go worse, like better now again, because... What do you have on your leg at the moment? I can show you if you want to see. It's not infection, like, it's like, it's just it's because I'm round that, I'm, I'm very badly, I'm itching. So I do, I do worse because it's, I'm scratching you, so it's itchy. So, so it's... It looks painful, it looks sore. It's so, yeah, just it's... So you did that yourself today? You changed Yeah, yourself. I don't need, I just put a normal, normal basic bandage, yeah. It's not supposed to be even just bandage like that, just I just done it just to cover it, to not go sticky for trousers. Are you due to see the nurse next to have the compression bandage? Yes, I'm supposed to be getting it like three times in a week, like Monday, uh, Tuesday, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just the nurse like supposed to be what been doing that that left it, and it's just one nurse, so it's not enough nurses there. So they say to me like once in a week now, and it's not enough. You know what I mean? I even, not enough nurses. No, no it's, and, and, and this one, if you're not going to look after the proper, mm -hmm. you're never going to heal it. And even I can I can put my bandage myself dressing. Just you need to do compression, and compression you can't do yourself. You have to be somebody who's who's who is who is professional, who, who know how to do it, you know. And I mean, you have experienced compression because I have seen you in yeah. practice. And what would your feeling be on having compression regularly when you when you used to come and see me? They feel much better, you know, when you go to compression, like you can see the legs going better because before I even don't, I can't have it compression because I have a DVT and uh, my legs been like bleeding very badly. So I have, been, have to wait when it's go. Yeah. <laughs> and after that, like, when you're starting to do good to comp proper compression, I start feeling much better then. And, and it was getting smaller. And it gets smaller and it got, got better, you know, just like um, the, sometimes if you miss the appointment or something and if it's the not nurse that the, you can't do nothing, you have to wait for the next appointment. And it's, it's, if it's not nurse there who's supposed to be do that, because you can't just go to normal nurse in the hospital because she don't know how to do it proper, you know, it's, you need somebody who's trained. Who's trained, it, definitely, definitely. When it was healing and you were getting the bandage done properly, how did you feel? Inside? Much better, you know, I started to like, like, like a little bit my, myself more, like, like, to, like, try to, because I'm telling you true, yeah, like, I just, when I have these problems, yeah, it's very hard to live, you know what I mean, it's because, you know, you've got drugs problems, you've got these legs, you know, now, no benefit, nothing, so I've been not in easy position, you know what I mean? I think you spoke to me a little bit a while ago around the difficulty you had when some clinicians find it hard to touch you. Yeah. And can you tell me a little bit about how that made you feel? Yeah, I just, when I come to, remember that, that day, first time I come, I meet you when I come from the prison, yeah. and, and after that, I've been in the street and I miss lots of appointments, and. The first appointment when I come to you, my legs has been very mess, you know, because I've been in the street. So, so I just been a little bit like, apologize to you that day. I say sorry because my legs smell, and you know, you make me feel like you, you say don't worry because you know, just you know, so you show me like you, you know, you wash my leg, everything. Because I can feel like you're not like, don't, like worried or you don't feel like not comfortable to touch my leg because before that I've been in an emergency in the hospital. I don't know the name, just a nurse. I don't even want to touch my leg, and that make you feel not, not good, you know what I mean? Like, very, like, you can feel that, you can see that, you know? So you need some nurses, like, you can show you, like, it, like you don't worry to touch your leg or something, because some, the legs, it, sometimes when it's got this problem, it don't look nice, you know? It's, it's hard, it's, it's hard. It's very hard. I suppose professionally, as nurses, we're meant to care. Exactly. And um, it's really difficult. Yeah, that make you feel very, very, I've been very like, like not, I've been angry. I've been not happy because I say, well, why, why you come here if you don't want to, to, to touch the leg? You know what I mean? I said, so I can touch myself. Tell me what to do, and I do it myself. If you don't, it just I, I know like you show me like you got nurses like it, it, it like care proper because because you've been put the cream, you wash it, and you can like proper caring. You know what I mean? So 
That's why I've been happy to come to you to see you. And it's, seriously, it's true. I think one of the things that we need to adapt to as a profession and as a healthcare system is to be more flexible. You know, COVID has shown us that we can work in different ways and we can push the boundaries. But, you know, life and illness and sickness and wound care is not nine to five. Yeah. And I do, I do think that we need to be more flexible. Definitely. I know time is short and, and appointment slots are yeah. short, but life is not like that. And you spoke about, you know, if you're, if you're on the streets and you can't get to Exactly, that's, sorry to jump in, just definitely this year, because like I tried to explain to the last week, the nurses here, like the nurses say to me, you have to come like uh, Tuesday and Friday because the one nurse left it. It's not enough, not enough nurses for that. Just I tried to explain, and she said, she, when you now miss the Tuesday example, you have to wait all week, yeah, for the appointment and, and to go to see her to do dressing. And if not, the leg is, is without the dressing. And that's not, that's not, that's not, uh, 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 sometimes you do mistake, yeah, you miss the appointments. It's happened, it's life. You know what I mean? You, you never, and especially in my, my style of life, yeah, you know what I mean? I, I have, having drug problems, no, prob no benefit problems, so it's not so easy for me, no. you know what I mean? I, I, I don't blame no one, it's my fool what, what's happened to me. I put myself in this position. Just I'm trying, I'm, like, if I can, like, if it's not the nurse, like, how supposed to be the dress, uh, changing dressing is there, it's not, it's more, it's going more worse, isn't it? Like, I suppose what we're saying is, you know, we need to be more flexible and we need to work together. Yeah. You know, you've come this far to, to get, to want to get the wound healed, then we need to try and work with you. Definitely. Uh, obviously, we know one of the reasons that we're here today is to talk about the Legs Matter campaign, which is running from Monday the 12th to Friday the 16th of October. And that's about raising awareness of lower limb and foot conditions. And just to say, we've been really fortunate um, to have the support of Filling Eyes uh, in Camden and Islington. You have helped us film this today with David. Um, but there is, there is an issue with having funding and recognition for wound care and inclusion health, particularly for people experiencing homelessness, for people with a history of injecting illicit substances. It's a real problem and, you know, David and I and the Flick team are here to actually say, mm. you know, it can't be hidden anymore. We have to raise awareness and we know we're filming this in London, but we know that it is a problem around the country and not just in England, but in Scotland. Wales and, and even in Ireland that there are issues with wound care and inclusion health. Can you, what can you imagine life like being if you didn't have this now? What, what would you do? I know we've spoke about this in the past, but if you didn't have your wounds, what would you do? A big, big, big different life, you know what I mean? Like I'm in relationship because I read these rules, I lose my relationship, you know, and everything is, that make you very hard. You know, in your life is a big, is a big, big problem. You know, because you can't do things what you can do normally. What would you? What would be your message? To the message just, just to get more nurses to more clinics because it's big help for the people like me. Because if it's not, if it's not these clinics, is, is people don't people don't get help from the people who's supposed to be help you. It's, you know, and I suppose you want your life back. Definitely. You want your life is difficult as it is, and you want to be able to walk around and not have wound on your leg. Yeah, do different things. Starting to do, you know, I want to stop my stop my my habit, my drugs, and do things different things. Just these things because I got these legs like that that make me to take it even the drugs more because. I'm just saying myself, oh, this life's never going to heal, the example, you know what I mean? Like, it's really hard. to make me for, to, to forget or something because people watching you different way, you can't do, just, I like, I want to change, you know what I mean? And this is, these things help me, help me to change because I got someone there to, who can help me to change, you know? Mm -hmm. Just if there's no one there, is is. There are definitely people here who care. For yeah. sure. Yeah. And I think sharing your story will help a lot of people out there who we don't even realise are there. I've been working in this field for a long time, over 15 years. Mm. Um, and as you know, I did a piece of research on it. So I know the problem. And that's why I care so much, because I, I think it can't be hidden any longer. It's, it's not right. It's cruel mm. in a way. You know, we have to provide care for everyone. Definitely. And, and not just certain populations, because... Uh, they're more known 
you know, in, in mainstream society, we have to include everybody. Hmm. That's the end of the video, everybody. And I have seen the video once or twice, I have to admit, it's not an easy thing to watch because obviously I came home to um, my home, my family and um, food on the table. And, you know, I'm always very aware of the situation that David was, was in. Um, so it is, it's a very real issue, homelessness in, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our cities and in our families. It's something that we're not uh, disconnected from. It's very much something that we're connected with. Uh, so thank you all for listening to that. I'm wondering if there are any questions at all. If anyone would like to ask a live question, it's a lot to take in. It's quite an emotional um, video to watch. I'm just wondering if anyone has any comments. We've got a, a question from Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Sarah Gardner. How can we change this terrible stigma? That relates to homelessness and the negative attitudes? That's a really good question, Sarah. I think it starts from the little things in life, like everything. Um, it's about how we talk about people and it's about the language that we use. And I'm really aware of that. And it's not something maybe 10 years ago that I was so aware of um, and for no reason. Um, but now I'm extremely aware of the way we speak. So people experiencing homelessness, people with lived experience, Ultimately, that identifies and connects the person with us. So it is somebody's mother, somebody's son, somebody's nephew, somebody's husband. You know, these things are not disconnected from us. And I think, to be honest with you, you know, you could say it's a naivety that it is, or some may call it arrogance. I, I, we have to acknowledge um, that people who are experiencing homelessness, they are part of our community and they deserve to be heard. And um, yeah, we have to complain about that. So it's the little things, I think. It starts off about the way we speak about people and challenge maybe some of the negative stereotyping, some of the public images that exist around people who inject drugs um, doesn't always represent the person or the individual behind that. And that is something that I feel really strongly about challenging because if we don't, um, identify the human behind this, uh, we will never change things. Okay, I have another question here. There's quite a few. Um, I will, how do we introduce homeless people to your services and how do you let them know that there is a service for them? It's from um, Alexandra. It's a good question. I think please do connect with there's some amazing work going on around the country. I have to acknowledge about where there is homeless health teams, particularly in London. I know the teams um, and also the charitable sector. They do, they do amazing, fantastic work. Link off with people who are working in your area. Sometimes in nursing, particularly, we don't cross boundaries. We have mental health. We have you know, child health, adult health, and we don't cross over. And with this population, I think it's, it's a problem. That means that we're not sharing skills. So from having worked with the homeless health team over the years and in a homeless GP practice, I've learned so much. So, you know, we need to get out there and roll up our sleeves and get to know people in our area and the GPs as well. Quite a few questions. So, Another question around COVID. Yeah, I mean... The homeless health teams in London, the volunteer sector, they work, and I can only speak about London because that's what I was what I was seeing. They worked absolutely tirelessly during COVID and continue to do so. Um, and a lot of this, of course, has gone on behind the scenes. Um, we have a new uh, nurse homeless health lead for, for England, Elaine Goodwin, and um, that is amazing. You know, we have now this, this role model. And I know a lot of us, Elaine's just started a few weeks, but I know a lot of us will be looking to Elaine and supporting her in her role. So I think that in itself is, is great news. Um, and we look forward to supporting her in her role. 
It's another question here from Melanie around pain, um, best practice, and how to encourage people who are homeless who are homeless to use compression. I mean, these are quite these are not easy questions to answer in a few in a few seconds, Melanie. Pain is like the elephant in the room. What I can say is pain is very individual and just because a person has an addiction, they cannot be judged on their pain because of that. So you still have to listen and to you know, write down the full patient history. We cannot judge that they do not need analgesia because they have an underlying addiction. So it, it's not something that I can answer quickly, um, but I think getting to know the individual and working with the different health teams surrounding that person will help paint a better picture of that. Compression with venous ulcers definitely helps. And I've seen that, but sometimes when you're trying to start compression, maybe with any patient who's had a poor experience, it can be difficult because they already have maybe fear around the compression, maybe fear even about you, the clinician. Do you have certain stigma or prejudice? So it's about starting off on the right foot, having good manners, introducing yourself, listening to that person. Time is really important. Um, and of course it's so limited, but by doing that and by explaining, you know, explaining the veins and the arteries and the lower limb, what's happened, maybe why they have the wound in the first place. Often, sometimes patients come and they don't know that. And then explaining about the compression. I'm a great believer that we can teach patients, but you know, there does need to be specialist oversight because as Anne said earlier, the diagnosis is really important. So for, for patients maybe who are experiencing homelessness, who are already receiving wound care, I've no doubt the goodwill surrounding that, but I have questions around healing outcomes. So if you're seeing patients, how, old, how long is that wound there? If it's there a couple of years, something is not right. So it's about, do they have an underlying diagnosis? Have they seen a vascular surgeon? Have they had a scan? And there's questions around that in itself because, you know, they may need support to attend that appointment. And, and that needs to be arranged. So it's not, it's not an easy thing, but it's very doable. And I think that's where the specialist oversight can come in. Another question from Sarah. It would be good for Legs Matter to have a section dedicated to lower limb care in our homeless community. Absolutely, Sarah. Um, and I know myself um, and uh, the London Network for Nurses and Midwives for Homeless Health and Hugh and I are looking to develop some uh, wound care guidance for um, our homeless community. So yeah, it's something that we're, we're working on. A question from Hannah, Hannah Smith. Hi, Hannah. Worked with the homeless community during her district nurse training. Yeah, eyes were opened. Thank you for the video, very emotive. It seems that like ulcer hosiery kits would be beneficial. Problems with washing hosiery. I mean, yes, all options are open in terms of therapeutic treatment. But again, I think, you know, yes, there is an element of self-care that we need to nurture and encourage, but only if there is that underlying diagnosis. And if there hasn't been for whatever reason, we need to make sure that we go back to that patient and, and get that um, because we can't do the treatment without the, the diagnosis. Well. We just need to be careful about that. Um, yeah, I would, I would definitely suggest that community nurses, a lot of community teams already have had exposure to um, people experiencing homelessness, but if not, please do get in touch with your local teams. I'm sure they'd be delighted to hear from you. I have about two minutes left before we finish up. I'm not sure if anyone wants to ask a live question or make any further comments. I hope that's been helpful for everybody. As I said, it, it was um, incredibly brave of David to come on board and share his story. It's not an easy thing to do. And I think it's an example to us all how if we want to change things, we need to, um, I suppose, get out there and make some noise. And that's what Legs Matter has been about this week. So I'm incredibly proud and privileged to be a part of the campaign. And, you know, it is, it is a campaign. It, it, it is something that we need to keep pushing forward and something that I hope to involve more actively our vascular teams who I'm already speaking about that. So thank you all so much. We have about two minutes left, but we may finish up beforehand if there's nothing further. Can I say something quickly? Please do, Anne, please. <laughs> I, I was fascinating and thank you for uh, allowing us to see it. Um, when I was an MP, there's an old party 
group on leg wounds in the House of Commons. And we need government to do far more, to be far more aware. And one of the things, uh, the ways of pushing it is to contact your local MP and ask them to raise the issue, call for the necessary things to help people who have leg wounds, get the diagnosis, make more people aware, go after your MP. That's something everybody can do. I completely agree with you, Anne. And that is, I think that's going to be on our, my, definitely on the top of my to-do list. Thank you, Anne. Very wise words, as our colleagues are saying. Thank you so much. And to everybody for joining us, please do watch this back and share this video. And I wish you all a very wonderful Friday and a good evening. Thank you.